Welcome back, fellow babies, to Pack the Factor on Sifted.net. Uh, if you're watching as a Patreon patron or as a YouTube subscriber, thank you so much for your support. If you're watching for free on YouTube a week late, uh, at a minimum, all of you, please link your Twitch Prime account, your Amazon Prime account, because Amazon will pay us for the privilege. It costs you nothing. And the instructions are in the show description below. Remember, you have to re-up this about every month. So, you know, just please go down, relink it if you haven't done so in a while, because we'll get a couple of bucks for nothing. It costs you nothing. Today's question from Sifted from Cinetyke. Xbox, or Microsoft if you, if you care, has spent lots of money and effort on backwards compatibility, while PlayStation's efforts have been rather luck, lackluster minus the PlayStation 3. What is the true value of backwards compatibility? Is it worth it to spend a significant amount of money or resources on it? Does the advent of YouTube Let's Play videos change the equation? With technology and graphics improving so rapidly, is there enough interest in playing old games to rectify the investment? You know, the whole philosophy behind backward compatibility was that your library of content wouldn't lose its value instantly when a new console came out. And I think Microsoft's done a better job of it than Sony. But, you know, I think with digital downloads now, it's pretty easy um, for everybody because you can essentially remaster a PS4 game and make it work on PS5. And so, you know, they can have you with a digital key. Um, so it's easy to do. The answer is, I don't think most people care and I don't think most people value it. Um, I used to think so. So if you, know, you can find me writing about this from PS2 to PS3 you know, back in 06, um, how everybody cared about it, they don't. Um, and as Shane pointed out a few episodes ago, nobody wants to play Tony Hawk Pro Skater 3, except me. Um, so no, I, I think that there's a point of diminishing return um, the, the real question is, is there a lot of money and effort on it? I don't know. Like, I think not. I think that if you, if you can make the digital file compatible with your current architecture, and sure, the game runs at 30 frames a second, you know, it's not, it's not super high resolution or anything. If the gamer wants to play it in standard definition, that's cool, and that'll be fine. They're not going to upscale the signal and make the game, you know, 4K, 240 frames a second. They just won't waste time and effort. So making the game play for the handful of people who care, maybe. If it's small money, it's worth it. But I would say no. I don't know if we're ever going to get new consoles. I mean, you might get one more generation, but um, the market is moving towards all streaming all the time and playing on any device. And that's really the way I think that we're going we're gonna to migrate you may end up still having console launches. It's just that I don't think you're gonna need a console. So you may end up with a game that's playable on your TV with your PC as the microprocessor. You know, essentially download it to your PC hard drive and play it on your TV and it'll work. And that's a better architectural sol solution um, than having to sell people a dedicated console. It actually just makes more sense. Um, so I think it's probably gonna go away and every game will be backward compatible. And I think the reason Microsoft has put so much effort into it is they're trying to sell Game Pass. And so they're trying to be identified as the company that lets you play catalog content. And they're gonna to try to put that catalog content on a subscription service. So my bias is um, there's some interest in playing old games that'll go up with catalog services that are subscription like Game Pass and Microsoft's trying to brand themselves as the best in class who provides the older game experience. We'll see, because again, I, don't, I haven't seen metrics on what people are spending time with on Game Pass, but my guess is 90% of the time spent is games that came out in the last two or three years. And again, it probably will change if it's a remastered Call of Duty Modern Warfare 1 or something, you know, from 07. If that came out, maybe you get renewed interest in, in some iconic classic title like that. Um, I do think, like, when you get stuff like the Halo Master Chief Collection and you get to play all the Halos, I bet there is a significant amount of time spent playing Halo 2, you know, which was a good game. It was 04, I think. Um, I, again, I, I don't know that I played it, but it was remastered. I think I did play it on Master Chief. It was good. It looked good. Um, it was surprisingly easy compared to the, the other Halos. Um, so, 
you know, old guys like me, I think Nintendo dads want to play old Nintendo console, you know, content. Um, I think we're getting to the point where original gangster Xbox owners are having kids and want to play with their kids. So yes, I think that Microsoft's grown with its audience and I think you'll see more and more of that. But it won't have to be backward compatible, it'll be streaming. And so that's where I think it's headed. I think Sony is segmenting its audience into the, mo the fans most willing to spend the most money. And so if you charge more and more and give more and more, each tier is gonna have a smaller slice. So let's just say they have 25 million PS Plus members. It'll be, you know, 18 million at the lowest tier, 5 million at the next tier, and 2 million at the highest tier. And that, pro if those numbers are close, that probably is about right. About 10% of the total audience really cares about the old stuff. And they're willing to extract an extra five bucks a month out of those people. That makes sense. I think that's what it is. That, the, the price difference was, it was five dollars apart. So that makes sense. So it's five bucks a month more for the two million guys at the end. That makes sense. And and it's not very expensive to make those games available by streaming because they've been doing it with PS Now for a long time. So you know, but they bought Guy Kayan on live. They've had the streaming technology forever. Um, they're, they've been more into it than anybody. They just haven't been as successful with subscriptions. And I think that they're finally figuring out how to segment the content and appeal to the highest common denominator at the highest price, which is the, that last couple of million. And I might be wrong. It might be, you know, 10 at the lowest tier and seven and, and, and five or whatever. But you know, whatever, it's, it's, a, it's probably a, a small percentage, 10% of total at the highest tier, but it could be 20. It's probably not 50. And again, maybe they're gonna keep adding so much content to the highest tier that they can upsell everybody into the highest tier over time, which is kind of how Netflix started. You know, Netflix is trying to get you to do the HD option when we didn't all have HD TVs. And then they're trying to get you to do the 4K option when we didn't all, all have 4K TVs. I still don't subscribe to 4K Netflix and I do have a 4K TV, but I don't care, it looks fine. Thank you guys uh, who are Patreon patrons. Thank you YouTube subscribers. Uh, thank all of you who have Twitch Prime accounts and link them to your Amazon Prime account. All of those are ways that uh, Shane gets support to keep the shows coming. Um, and if you can't do any of those things, then at least you know follow me on Twitter. You're still getting the content a week late, but I will engage with you on Twitter unless you're an but I probably won't. Um, we'll see you next time.